We're in a series right now on practicing the way of Jesus. A lot has changed over the last week in our country, but one thing has not. We are still very much a church built around the idea of following Jesus. And for us, that means living into three goals. Say this out loud with me. One is to be with Jesus. Two is to become like Jesus. And three is to do what he did. Wherever you're at on the socio-political spectrum, the left, the right, or the many of us that feel very dazed and confused in between, hopefully we can all agree that the need of the hour is for men and women who are with Jesus and like Jesus and on about the kind of stuff that Jesus was on about in the world. So we've been asking this question, how do we change? Because most of us aren't there now. How are we in the language of the New Testament transformed? And the short answer is it's not exactly how a lot of us think. We've been working through our spiritual formation paradigm, which kind of years of teaching in the making. We covered teaching and practice over the last couple of weeks. If you're not here, please go back and listen to the podcast. We're on, I think, week seven. Each one builds on the next. And now up on the docket, we're ready to get into community. And we'll actually camp out here for a few weeks because community is so vital in how we change, how we are transformed to experience this kind of life to the full. Mother Teresa said that loneliness is the leprosy of the modern world. Over the last 10 years, and I'm sure you've seen this in survey after survey, actually in parallel with the rise of social media, the number of people that mark lonely or don't have somebody to connect with or a close friendship or family member has skyrocketed all through our nation. This is easy to miss in the digital age. We have Facebook, some of you, not Alex, and Instagram, and Twitter, and email, and text messaging, and FaceTime. We're more connected than ever, but connectivity is not the same thing as community. Sherry Turkle, I'm not sure if you're familiar with her work, she's a sociologist and psychologist out of MIT. She's really the leading expert in the world on what technology, in particular the digital age, is doing to the human condition. We've been writing about it for three decades now. Her most recent book, Alone Together, is so disturbing, don't read it, you'll freak out. But She writes this, we are lonely but fearful of intimacy. Digital connections may offer the illusion of companionship without the demands of friendship. Our networked life allows us to hide from each other even as we are tethered to each other. We would rather text than talk. When technology engineers intimacy, relationships can be reduced to mere connections, and then easily connection becomes redefined as intimacy. Put otherwise, cyber intimacies slide into cyber solitudes. So loneliness is this deep ache, this pang at the heart of our culture, and at the same time, community, in spite of all of our tech, community is more elusive than ever before. So let's have a look at the way of Jesus as we move forward. Matthew chapter four, look down at verse 18. As Jesus was walking beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon called Peter and his brother Andrew. They were casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come, follow me, or that can be translated, become my apprentice or my disciple. Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. And at once they left their nets right there and followed him. Going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John. They were in a boat with their father Zebedee preparing their nets. Jesus called them, and immediately they left the boat and their father and followed him. Did Jesus call one disciple? No. No. He called Peter and Andrew and James and John, and he's just getting started. Now, these are good Torah-observant Jewish boys up in the Galilee, which was the hot spot for discipleship to a rabbi in first century Israel. But Jesus didn't just call the religious. Turn over to uh, Matthew chapter 9. We read this a few weeks ago, but let's just take one more look at it. Matthew chapter 9, verse 9. As Jesus went on from there, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the tax collector's booth. Follow me or become my disciple, he told him. And Matthew got up and followed him. Same story. While Jesus was having dinner at Matthew's house, many tax collectors and sinners came and ate with him and his disciples. When the the Pharisees saw this, kind of the uptight religious people, they asked his disciples, why does your teacher, your rabbi, eat with tax collectors and sinners? On hearing this, Jesus said, it's not the healthy who need a doctor, but those who are ill. Go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice, for I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. 
How rad is Jesus, by the way? Can we all agree on that? He's, he's pretty awesome. Matthew in this story is a tax collector. He's a Benedict Arnold, if you know anything about the cultural climate, a Jew working for the Roman Empire, the oppressor over the oppressed. Not surprisingly, his circle of friends is made up of other tax collectors and sinners. That was a term in the first century for non-observant or non-religious Jewish men and women. So there's quite a bit of variety in Jesus' new little community. Turn over to Matthew chapter 10, just one page to the right. Look at verse one. Jesus called his 12 disciples to him and he gave them authority to drive out impure spirits and to heal every disease and illness. These are the names of the 12 apostles. So Jesus has more than 12 disciples, hundreds if not thousands, men and women, but here are kind of, here's his inner circle, his 12 apostles. First Simon, who's called Peter, and his brother Andrew. James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, read about those guys. Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew, the tax collector, James, son of Alphaeus and Thaddeus, Simon the zealot, and Judas Iscariot who betrayed him. Interesting, only two men get a descriptor. One is a guy we already know. Uh, The other, Simon the zealot, is a guy we don't really know anything about, don't read about before or after. What's going on here? Well, this is a wide range of people. As we said, Matthew's a tax collector. He worked for Rome. Simon, we read, though, was a zealot. That was a violent, insurgent sect of first century Jews who used guerrilla tactics to fight Rome. They were called Sicaria in Hebrew. It's like the recent movie from last year with Emily Blunt or whatever was named after this. It's a phrase meaning dagger men because they would hide a dagger in their cloak and they would sneak up to a Roman military officer and they would slit his throat and then disappear back into the crowd. So can you imagine like Matthew and Simon in the same little Bible study group? Like just imagine like a make America great again, rural, giant truck, gun in the back, like all that stereotype next to like Aaron Sorkin or Michael Moore, some Hollywood leftist elite. Like, what do you think it means, Michael? I don't know, what do you think it means, Robert? Like, can you imagine that in the little small group Bible study? Do you think there would have been tension? Do you think they would have had words? Do you think politics would have come up? Do you think politics would have come up? Yes, do you think it would have gone well? No, absolutely not. So Jesus puts together this little community from across the spectrum. And it's not just the like, socio-political thing. You have personality clash, you have Peter, the type A loud, and then you have Thomas, the kind of introspective, introverted blogger, cynic type or whatever. And then you have James and John who are called in another passage, the sons of thunder. That was Jesus' nickname. That's not a compliment, just to clarify. When it's Jesus, it's not, you don't want to be called sons of thunder. These men were fiery, like there's one story, Jesus called down fire from heaven and eat the village alive. And Jesus is like, I think you missed the Sermon on the Mount. Were you you not taking notes on the love your enemy part? I think think you missed that, bro. Not bro, I doubt Jesus said bro, but um, (laughs) whatever. And then you have them next to Judas, cold, analytical, calculating, all of that. My point is this sounds so idealized, all this diversity and breadth, but the reality was I doubt they had an easy time getting along. And if you ever read the Gospels, you know that's true. Here's one example. Turn over to Matthew chapter 20. Matthew chapter 20. Most of you will know this story. Verse 20. Then the mother of Zebedee's sons came to Jesus with her sons, kneeling down and asked a favor of him. What is it you want, he asked. She said, grant that one of these two sons of mine may sit at your right and the other at your left in your kingdom. Uh, You don't know what you're asking, Jesus said to them. Can you drink the cup I'm going to drink? That's a metaphor for his coming death. We can, they answered. (laughs) Jesus said, wrong answer, bro. You, You will indeed drink from my cup, but to sit at my right or left is not for me to grant. These places belong to those for whom they have been prepared by my father. Now, when the 10 heard about this, they were indignant. So, I mean, imagine the story. You have the sons of thunder behind mommy, not so sons of thunder now, by the way. And mommy is asking essentially, hey Jesus, when you come into your kingdom, make James your vice president and John your secretary of state or whatever. And when the other disciples, the other 10 hear about that, they are indignant. That's Bible for really angry and ticked off. They go on a Facebook rant about, you know, James and John, the sons of thunder, whatever. They go off and you would be too. There's selfish ambition, jealousy, gossip, infighting. They go behind the other guy's backs and mommy is involved, like all of that. But is Jesus surprised? 
No, look at 25, Jesus called them together and he said, you know that the rulers of the Gentiles lorded over them and their high officials exercise authority over them. It's a great line but for an S now, by the way. Not so with you, instead whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first must be your slave, just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Once again, Jesus is just absolutely amazing. So Jesus goes off in this teaching about the upside down nature of the way of Jesus in the kingdom of God. For now, all I want you to see is this pattern. There is the ideal of community, then there is the messy reality of community, and discipleship happens in the space in between. We see this exact same pattern play out in the New Testament. Turn over to Acts chapter two. I don't know, a quarter of inch or so to the right. Acts chapter two. If you've ever read the New Testament, you will recognize this story. It's right after the coming of the Holy Spirit to create what we now call the church. We read this snapshot or summary of the first church. Chapter two, verse 42. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship. It's koinonia in Greek. It can be translated fellowship or deep relationships or partnership is a way to translate it or really in today's language, community. Everyone, to the breaking of bread, to eating together around the table and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together, had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anybody who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes. So thousands of people at the temple courts and then in homes, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. The Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. All sorts of people coming to faith. Turn the page, here's another snapshot. Exact same church, chapter four, verse 32. All the believers were one in heart and mind. No one claimed that any of their possessions was their own, but they shared everything they had. Hey, you need, a, you need to make rent, you need a car, you need a house, great, here. With great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and God's grace was so powerfully at work in them all, here's the sign of it, justice. There was no needy person among them. For from time to time, those who owned land and sold house, houses sold them, brought the money from the sale and put it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to anyone who had need. Now, it sound, this sounds amazing, right? It's hard, at least for me, I'm an idealist, but it's hard for me not to read this with a, at least a ping of nostalgia, like, oh, it was so, the church was so much better back then. But just keep reading. Chapter five, verse one, exact same church. Here's another story. Now a man named Ananias, together with his wife Sapphira, also sold a piece of property. With his wife's full knowledge, he kept back part of the money for himself, but brought the rest and put it at the apostles' feet. Then Peter said, Ananias, how is it that Satan has so filled your heart that you have lied to the Holy Spirit? You know, Peter is just so gentle, and have kept for yourself some of the money you received for the land. Didn't it belong to you before it was sold? And after it was sold, wasn't the money, it was all yours. What made you think of doing such a thing? You've not just lied to human beings, but to God. When Ananias heard this, he fell down and died. And great fear seized all who heard what had happened. Uh, yeah. Then some young men came forward, wrapped up his body, and carried him out and buried him. And I just really wish our church was like the early church. <laughs> Are you sure? Ushers, we have somebody who lied and during prayer response, they're dead. Would you take them out and bury them real fast for us? Great. Yeah, I'm not sure you really wish our church was like the early church. My point is even this church that was brand new, Holy Spirit, wind at the back, Peter and the, I mean, the disciples are in charge of the whole thing. Still, it's, it's not all, it's not all it's cracked up to be. Again, you have a gap between the ideal of community and the messy reality of community, and discipleship happens in the space in between. But this tension between the ideal and that liminal space that we live in, between that and the messy reality, it's hard for a lot of people. Have a look at this from Jean Bayer, the founder of La Arche, a famous community in Switzerland and then later around the world. He writes this, almost everyone finds their early days in a community ideal. It all seems perfect. They feel they are surrounded by saints, heroes, or at the least most exceptional people who are everything they want to be themselves. And then comes the letdown. The greater their idealization of the community at the start, the greater the disenchantment. 
If people manage to get through the second period, they come to a third phase, that of realization and true commitment. They no longer see other members of the community as saints or devils, but as people, each with a mixture of good and bad, darkness and light, each growing and each with their own hope. The community is neither heaven nor hell, but planted firmly on earth, and they are ready to walk in it and with it. They accept the community and the other members as they are. They are confident that together they can grow towards something more beautiful. So, Before we go home tonight, here's a few thoughts, I think five or six, I think five to be exact, on how you and I can grow as our community, as our church, into something more beautiful. First is this, if you're taking notes, go ahead and write this down. First, community is non-optional for discipleship to Jesus. Jesus did not have a disciple, he had disciples. You never once read about Jesus and Peter. You read about Jesus, Peter, James, and John, or Jesus and the 12, or Jesus and the 70, and Jesus as hundreds, or Jesus and thousands, all at Jesus' feet. You can't follow Jesus alone. You just can't. You can't separate your discipleship to Jesus from involvement in a community, specifically in the church, because the two go together. Um, To borrow from another metaphor, in the New Testament there are two dominant metaphors for what it means to be the people of God. One is that you are an apprentice or a disciple or a follower of Jesus, the rabbi, and the other is that you, that we are a delphos, is the word used in Greek. It means sibling, brother, sister, we're family, and God is our father, and we have become family. Um, Those of you that read Galatians this last week in the Read Through the Bible, we read all about how we were adopted into the Father's family. Um, I think about my daughter, who I don't call my adopted daughter, but if you, she's black and she did not come from me. She's from Uganda. And I think about her when she was adopted into my family. At the same moment she became my daughter, she became Jude and Moses' sister, which was kind of a bummer for her. But, um, no, I'm kidding. They are great older brothers. And she can't separate her relationship with me from her relationship to Jude and Moses and Tammy and Grandma and Grandpa and Aunt Uncle and our community, it's all wrapped up together because we're family. In the same way, we can't be in relationship with God the Father, but not a part of the Father's family or what in the New Testament is called the church. This is so hard, I think, for a lot of people to swallow in our hyper-individualized culture, particular in Oregon, Portland, end of the Oregon Trail. Then you have, like, we're Mecca for the spiritual but not religious kind of crowd, ethos. And then even if you grew up in the church, you have this strict kind of me and Jesus pietist strain that goes back hundreds of years in America. You know, a recent nationwide survey done by Barna, which is like one of the top think tanks for kind of Christian, none of us trust polling right now, but whatever. Um, Think tanks in our nation did this huge study on discipleship in the church in America, and it was interesting. 38% of people in this survey, and it was by far the largest category, I think there were four categories, this was by far the largest. When asked, what is your preferred method of discipleship, marked the box that said, quote, on my my own. So how do most people want to follow Jesus? It was like with a mentor, with a community, like 38%. The largest category was just me and Jesus. We're good. Thank you very much. Me, Jesus, the podcast, whatever. I'm okay. But it doesn't work that way. I've just been on this Ronald Rollheiser trip lately, reading a ton of his stuff. I love this. I read it a few days ago. Part of the very essence of Christianity is to be together in a concrete community, with all the real human faults that are there and the tensions that this will bring us. Spirituality for a Christian can never be an individualistic quest, the pursuit of God outside of community, family, and church. The God of the incarnation tells us that anyone who says he or she loves an invisible God in heaven and is unwilling to deal with a visible neighbor on earth is a liar, since no one can love a God who cannot be seen if he or she cannot love a neighbor who can be seen. If you're new to the Bible, that's a quote from 1 John. Hence, a Christian spirituality is always as much about dealing with each other as it is about dealing with God. I hate that last line, but it's so true. A Christian spirituality is always as much about dealing with each other as it is about dealing with God. So you have to be in community. It's non-optional, but this is a good thing because, secondly, if you're taking notes, Community is non-optional for a well-lived life. Follower of Jesus or Muslim or atheist or whatever, Baha'i, whatever you are, if you are a human being, you were made for relationships. The author of this great book we have for sale on our book thing, 
called The Relational Soul, written by two kind of leading psychologists about discipleship and community and how we're, we get healing in relationship, have this great line, at the core of our being is this truth. We are designed for and defined by our relationships. We were born with a relentless longing to participate in the lives of others. Fundamentally, we are relational souls. We cannot not be relational. We cannot exist well without connection and communion with another. I don't care how introverted you are tonight, and I'm on the Myers-Briggs, I'm like at the top. The book by Quiet by Suzanne Cain, anybody read that? It's like the Bible and then that for me. Like that, I'm way up there. I don't care how introverted you are, your relational soul, you need relationships. It doesn't matter how successful you are, how much money you make, how well you do in your career, if you live in your dream house, drive your dream car, whatever, if one relationship close to you in your life is off, you are emotionally a wreck. It doesn't matter. And your relationship with God is all out of sync at the same time because everything is tied together. Life is better in community. Life is better when we journey through the highs and lows with companions in the way. I keep thinking of that line the last few days from Romans 12, rejoice with those who rejoice and mourn with those who mourn. It's a good line, I think, for the last week, as hard as it is. You know, in the good times, we rejoice. Another way to translate is that we celebrate together. What's your impulse when something really good happens? You get a promotion, or you buy your first house, or she says yes to a date, or marriage, or whatever your thing is. What's your first impulse? Well, yeah, but you call up your friends. And you're like, we need to go party, right? How, how, do you party alone? No, I'm like really introverted, but even I'm not like, let me buy myself a beer. Like, no, I just don't do that. Like you need to celebrate with other people. Hey, let's go out, let's have a drink, let's have dinner, let's celebrate, let's blow something up, a firework, I don't know. Like you need to celebrate with other people. And then on the flip side, in the bad times, we mourn together. It was just with somebody in our church whose dad died recently and he said something a few days ago. He's like, I don't need a sermon, I don't need a book. I just need people to be with me. I'll hear people say that who are grieving. Just, I don't need you to talk. I just, just come over. I just, I need you to be with me. We're going to tell stories over the next few weeks about life and community at Bridgetown. And a lot of those stories are just about how community was there for somebody in a crisis, in a tragedy, in a diagnosis, in unemployment, in something. Community was there, was family. If you grew up in community, if that's your normal, which is as it should be, then you have no idea how rare that is, in particular in the modern urban digital age. Third is this, if you're taking notes. Community is the context where we are transformed. I said this a few weeks ago, but community plays a key role in our spiritual formation. At a surface level, you know, we become like the people we hang out with, the people that we spend time with, we dress like them, think like them, vote like them, listen to the music they listen to, all of that. But at a deeper level, community, and by that, I would define that as intentional relationships around the way of Jesus. It does two things in our transformation into Christ-likeness, exposure and encouragement. Exposure, it exposes what's actually inside of you. Just like in the story of the 12, and James, John, Mommy, All of that was there, selfish ambition, greed, like dishonesty, that was all there in James and John, but it would not have come out if they had stayed home with mommy. An anger problem, a temper, that was all there in Peter, but it would not have come out if he had stayed back home with dad in the boat. Community exposes what's actually inside of you, what Pete Scazzaro, that writer we love, the Emotionally Healthy Church, calls your shadow side. Here's how he defines your shadow side. Your shadow is the accumulation of untamed emotions, less than pure motives and thoughts that while largely unconscious, strongly influence and shape your behaviors. It is the damaged but mostly hidden version of who you are. And we all have a shadow side, all of us. The thing about your shadow side is it's not only hidden from other people, but a lot of the time it's hidden from us. Like not all of us are Peter Pan and have this high shadow awareness. You know, what I'm, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, some of you grew up in the 90s right there. Others of you are like, everybody under 28 is like, what, what? Hugh Jackman, terrible, you ruined the story, all right? <laughs> if you know what I'm saying. Not all of us see our shadow side. A lot of us are blind to it until we step into community. Any kind of deep, honest relationship, a marriage, 
a deep friendship with, you know, whatever, a tight-knit Bridgetown community, you actually step into that and it exposes where you're really at. Uh, Just a week or two ago, I had a hard conversation with somebody in our staff who was kind enough to basically call me on my shadow side and uh, basically said, hey, there's some ways that you're leading our staff that are just unhealthy and you're critical, and he was very gracious about it, but you don't create a safe place for people to disagree, and it's, it's all true and all stuff I know. And so we had a good talk, and I had to repent to him and repent to our staff, and that was just no fun at all, but it was really good for me. And it was really interesting. I was in this conversation about it with Gerald, who was also there, and, and I, was, I think I was saying, hey, I want, you know, if this ever happens again, I want you to come to me, open door policy, all that kind of stuff. And then I said, I think it's safe to say that I'm, I'm good at repenting. And then I, you know, <laughs> but you're never really sure if you think that you're good at something, if you're actually good at something. So I said, Gerald, is that, is that true? And Gerald is so interesting. He, he said, yes. And then he had this like throwaway line. And he's, and he's like, but you, you always feel like you need to be understood. Mm. And he said it so nice, he was so kind. I don't, even, I don't know if it was much more than a passing thought. I cannot stop thinking about that for the last two weeks. <laughs> and I'm like, dang it. Just when I thought I was good at repenting, I realized that's so me, I need to explain myself. Here's why. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a, if you're into the Enneagram, I'm a type one. According to Enneagram Institute, I'm 1% of the population on the Myers-Briggs. I'm an INTJ. That's 1.3% of the population, the most rare of the male species. I just constantly feel misunderstood. So I have to explain myself. Well, I know that was really lame, and I'm super sorry, and I'm quick to repent. Here's why I did it. Do, 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 do. People don't care why I did it. They ju- I just need to say, I'm sorry. That was stupid. Please forgive me. Help me change. Like, that's the kind of stuff that doesn't come out unless you're in community. And there's that impulse in all of us just to be like, that was really awkward, I'm just gonna go make a new friend. (laughs) This is like the millennial way to deal with conflict. Unfriend you, bye. (laughs) You know, it's just like that. No, that's not a helpful way forward. But this is the way of Jesus. And, And as hard as it is, it's a beautiful reality of community. So that's what community does, exposure. But then in a healthy Jesus community, it also does on the back end of that, encouragement. We'll talk about this next week, but long story short, at a psychological and a neurological level, like literally in your brain chemistry, the only way to get healing from relational wounds is in relationship. So our deepest wounds come from relationship, mom, dad, a breakup, whatever, and our greatest healing comes from relationship. It's why it's so tragic when people are hurt by a divorce, family of origin, a breakup of relationship, when they wall off and say, I'm never gonna get close to somebody again because I don't wanna get hurt, they essentially stay broken forever. Because the only way to actually get at a psychological and neurological level, the only way to get healing is to step back into this time a healthy Jesus kind of relationship. My psychologist had this great line a few months ago. I was working with him on our spiritual formation paradigm. He's a PhD, brilliant guy. And we spent quite a bit of time working on it. And when we were talking about this community piece, if you remember that paradigm, he had this great line and he said, quote, Freud was all wrong, which you can say if you're him, But he was dead right on one thing. You fix your broken part in relationship. You fix your broken part in relationship. If you're an introvert like me, you wanna go off to Savi Island and fix it by yourself with your journal. And there's a place for that. But you fix your broken part in relationship. Community is where we get healing where we have family, a safe place to stumble and fall and have people help you back up again. All that to say, if you want to grow and mature into Christ-likeness, community is once again non-optional. I love this from that book, Slow Church, that we read that was going around at least about a year ago. The writers have this to say, spiritual formation occurs primarily in the context of community. Long-term interpersonal relationships are the crucible of genuine progress in the Christian life. People who stay, grow. People who leave do not grow. It is a simple but profound biblical reality that we both grow and thrive together or we do not grow much at all. I love that language of the crucible. Yes, community, if you're in one, if you're in it, you know it's really hard at times, but it's in the crucible of community that we're formed 
that were forged in the fire to be like our rabbi Jesus. Fourth is this, and I'll make this one fast. Community is not necessarily the same thing as a group of friends. I need to say this because we have so many kind of extroverted, socialite, fantastic people. It's easy to think, oh yeah, I know lots of people. I'm in community. Maybe, but maybe not. Um, sociology writes about you know, kind of strong ties and weak ties, if you're familiar with that paradigm. Strong ties are the relational bond between a mother and a child, or a brother and a sister, or you and your bestie. I think that's what you girls call it, right? Not to, not to gender stereotype, we don't say that. Guys, I don't, whatever, I just got myself in trouble. There comes an email. Um, <laughs> you and your bestie, uh, people you have in your favorites list in case of an emergency. Weak ties are your relationship with your barista or your banker or that coworker you share a meal with once every month or two. We live in a world with all sorts of weak ties and very few strong ties. It's easier than ever before to be connected to everybody but in community with nobody. Pull out your phone, the odds are you have hundreds, if not some of you thousands of weak ties that you can comment on or DM or email or text or even if you wanna go really old school in 90s, call. It was this thing forever ago. But would you? And, and if you did, would they answer? Would they pick up? I would go so far as to say there is no such thing as an online community. You've heard me harp on this before. Because community is by definition, Webster's Dictionary, people you live by. Once again, I love Sherry Turkle's definition of community. Communities are constituted by physical proximity. You live in the same neighborhood or city or by each other. Shared concerns for us practicing the way of Jesus. Real consequences, like you call each other out, you hold each other accountable. And common responsibilities for us, you're about the kingdom of God in Portland as it is in heaven. It's people you do life with, and that's become a cliche, but what we mean by that is people who see you on the good days and in the bad, who don't see the curated version of yourself the always make up on, never sad version of yourself, but who see the real you. And don't misread me, I'm not down on friends at all. It's if you're that extrovert, life of the part, beautiful, fantastic. You're exhausting, but we love you. <laughs> I just want you to see that your circle of friends is not necessarily the same thing as following Jesus in community. Fifth is this, community is the byproduct of commitment. Our generation, you know, I think we all feel this. We're stuck in this catch-22. On one hand, we ache for belonging. The hypermobility has made us placeless and uh, kind of the breakdown of the family has made us insecure and afraid and lonely. We ache for community. And yet, we also kind of want to keep our options open. Am I right? We approach relationships, a lot of us, myself included, with a consumer mindset, what's in it for me? Is this my kind of a person? How will this person make me feel or look or whatever? We live in a world of options, in particular with the internet and especially if you have money, so we hold out. What if there's somebody better out there? What if there's somebody cooler? Oh, that Bridgetown community, oh, that church, that's kinda cool, but what if there's a better one? I haven't been to all of them. I don't know all my options yet. And so we don't commit, we put everything at arm's length. We see this at Bridgetown, it's not to slam anybody because most of you break the stereotype to pieces, but we do see this more and more. People who, I'm a part of Bridgetown Church, means they come here once a month or so, listen to the podcast, and like follow us on Instagram. Okay, great, it's better than nothing, but that is not community. It's not even a sliver of all that God has for you. The reality is we can't have community without commitment. If we want community, in-depth, safe, open, honest, long-term relationships, then we have to commit to a group of people that is less than ideal, that isn't perfect, that isn't idealized, that has problems and issues. We just have to say, I'm in it with you. And not just to people, but even to a place. Our society's become so placeless, it's brutalizing to the human condition. And we see this in our roots as a city. We're called Stumptown. Why? Because this used to be a forest. The first settlers of our city were loggers. Think about a logger, a young single man for the most part, no family, who'd move to the city from somewhere else, live in a camp for six months, a year, two years, take natural resources from the city, and then move on. That ethos is still alive and well in our city. People come here, move here, and if that's you, welcome, but don't really settle, live in an apartment, rent, move every six months or a year, work a great job, enjoy the city, consume, eat and drink their way through the city for a while, and then move on. Okay, 
But there's something to the beauty of what, if you've ever read St. Benedict, what he called the vow, what he called stability. His definition of stability was the spiritual skill for staying put to get somewhere. How good is that? I found this vow from um, a monastery. I think I read this over you last year in the vision series. I just want to read it again because it's so inspiring. We vow to remain all our life with our local community. We live together, pray together, work together, relax together. We give up the temptation to move from place to place in search of an ideal situation. Ultimately, there is no escape from oneself. And the idea that things would be better someplace else is usually an illusion. And when interpersonal conflicts arise, we have a great incentive to work things out and restore peace. This means learning the practices of love, acknowledging one's own offensive behavior, giving up one's preferences, forgiving. Isn't that beautiful? Now don't freak out, I'm not asking you to take a vow of stability to Bridgetown Church or Portland, Oregon. But I'm saying God made you to live rooted. What would it look like for you to sink your life down into the soil of the city or wherever, wherever God has you now and in the future to live rooted? Don't be a logger, be a city builder. It's a very different kind of Portlander, a very different kind of settler that put this building up in I think 1894, 1896. They were thinking about you. Over a century later, they were thinking about their children and their children's children and their children's children's children and a bunch of weird hipsters that found out about it and moved in. (laughs) They were thinking about you and we're here because of them. So commit to a people and to a place. And finally is this, number six, community takes time and intentionality. Time, you know, whenever people are new to the church at basics class, I always say, welcome, we're so happy you're here, give it time. We want you in community, want you in just really robust relationships, it takes a while. We just had five new people join uh, my community, and it's fantastic, but man, it takes a while to get to know people from scratch. And intentionality, it won't just happen, especially in the chaos of the urban, digital, over-busy city and world we call home. Courtney Martin, in her book, The New Better Off, based on her great little TED Talk, She writes this, and she's writing about her experience in community and in a co-housing project. She writes, if you want to live like this with other people, you need not move somewhere special. You You need only be intentional about asking them to embrace interdependence with you. I love that. And then ritualize that commitment. We often fantasize about the village growing up around us spontaneously as if frequent reciprocity will magically appear in the cracks of our overscheduled lives. Rather than wishing for intentional community, we have to doggedly pursue it. Make it concrete, make it a shared Google calendar. Just make it real. Even if you are earnest and vulnerable, creating communities like these, creating community at all, requires shared space and time. It requires a genuine commitment to slowing down. So, as we start to wind down, how do we live this out at Bridgetown Church? Honestly, we are a big, we're not a mega church, but we are a big enough church that there is absolutely no way to get this kind of community out of our Sunday gatherings. This um, can be a great place to meet people, come early, be friendly, be hospitable in that four minutes before and after, take somebody out to ice cream down the street or whatever, serve. But this kind of community, for the most part, doesn't happen around a stage, but around a table. And Bridgetown is built just like that church we read about in Acts 2. That's kind of our model of large gatherings with a whole lot of people around a stage on Sunday, and then community all week long around a dining room table in an apartment or a house in your neighborhood, around a shared meal. We have upwards of 60 Bridgetown communities, which we used to call missional communities, most of which are, I don't know, 10, 12, 15 people. The best way to think about Bridgetown Church is as a network of communities spread out through the urban core of the city that come together here at FBC on Sunday nights. This Sunday gathering that you're at right now, we believe in it. It's a core practice based on the lifestyle of Jesus. He was in the synagogue every single Sabbath, so we follow Jesus' example. But then the rest of the week, he was with his disciples, like living it out at a table, at a park, on the road, serving all week long in community, and we follow that example as well, both and Sunday and community. Church around a stage, church church around a table, church in a pew, church on a couch, 
church with a lot of people, church with a dozen. We really believe in that both and, and our entire model is set up around that idea. My wife and I are here every Sunday that we're in town, and we live in community. We have for a number of years now. It started with the Normans over here who moved in, one house over <clears throat> from us, and we started to do life together. And, you know, we've been through a lot together. Honestly, the last couple of years, one of the reasons I haven't done a ton of talking about my own community is because we've been through some really gnarly stuff that I, I'm not at liberty to share, but it's been really hard. But I still can't say enough about it. It's been amazing. It's changed me. It's changed my wife, my children, my family, how we do life together, how we experience the way of Jesus. And we want so badly for you to experience community. Not the ideal of community. I've been through that. I've been through disenfranchisement. And I think I've come out to the other side. We want you to experience the messy reality and that beautiful space in between where we follow Jesus. And we're inviting you to step into that. Some of you are brand new to our church. Welcome, can't wait to meet you. We have a basics class coming up. You just, we just finished one, the next one's in January. That's how we welcome people into our communities three times a year, love to see you there. Others of you have been through that and maybe you never made it into a community or you were in a community but it just was less than ideal or, or honestly it just didn't work for you or whatever or people moved away because it's a placeless city or whatever and you're now you're kind of aimless. Others of you are in community, most of you, and are just going for it and it's hard but it's so good and it's so worth it. Wherever you're at, we just wanna invite you to lean into community, to reach out. There are people all around you that are new to our city. Every Sunday I meet people who have, I just met people this morning, multiple young couples just moved to the city, don't know a soul in the city. There are people in this room tonight that I know who just started following Jesus who literally don't have a single follower of Jesus as a friend who are sitting right around you not in community, don't know barely anybody. So lean in, reach out, open arms, open wide, the radical hospitality to people around you. We're inviting you not just to come to Sunday night, we're so happy you're here, but for us, this is just the beginning. The real money is life in community all week long. To end, I just wanna invite um, Gerald and our friend Jackie up here just to tell a story. Sometimes I think stories do a way better job. I've already said way too much tonight. This is Jackie, say hello. And uh, yeah. Hey, so first of all, Jackie, tell us how you got connected at Bridgetown Church. Yeah, so I actually moved to Portland four years ago, and I wasn't a Jesus follower. Uh, I happened to be going to grad school at the U of O in Portland, and I had two really faithful, awesome friends who are here tonight that were just really solid guys, and I knew that they went to church. So one day, I just felt compelled to ask them if I could come with and I did, and I happened to come during the Loveology series, which is exactly what I needed to hear at the time. It was what I was struggling with, and um, I came, I got connected into their group that they had already started, and they just welcomed me with open arms. They were super loving and um, open-minded, and I kind of went through the church, went, took a couple classes, met with Bethany, um, and eventually I got baptized in August, come which on. was awesome. <laughs> Um, yeah, so it was awesome. And then um, you were in community and something um, super tumultuous happened in your life. And talk us through that. Yeah, so about a year and a half ago, um, I was kind of experiencing some really stressful times at work and a really adversarial boss and just high pressure situations. And um, so I kind of started acting out and acting a little strange. And um, I was like, texting people at two in the morning. I wasn't able to sleep. I was like going on shopping sprees every other weekend. And my community noticed and they kind of were taken aback and at first didn't really know what to do. But um, this couple in our group, Carolyn and Kellen, they um, just kind of invited me over, sat me down and asked, you know, Jackie, we're noticing these things in you, and these are like not characteristic of your personality and your behaviors. We're really concerned for you. Um, and they just like were there for me. And um, I was really taken aback and really shocked and like angered and overwhelmed, but um, I knew that they really cared about me. And so I just took it for what it was. And it wasn't until, um, another friend, um, a non-Jesus follower, pointed out that um, I needed to get professional help. And so um, I, with her help, um, checked myself into the psych ward at OHSU. 
and there I found out that I was diagnosed bipolar one disorder. And that was, came as a shock, and I wasn't prepared for that. And my community just like showed up for me and was there for me. Actually, uh, one of the married women in um, our group, and I like know this was totally God, but she happened um, to have just quit her job. And so she was available for me 24 seven to take care of me as I was going through medication change after medication change, struggling with the medical bills and um, the credit card debt that I had racked up. She like helped me set up a budget, make a payment plan. And she cooked for me, cleaned my apartment as I was like struggling on the couch, like dealing with these side effects. She called Bethany when I needed a little bit of tough love and spiritual healing. <laughs> and it was, it was Come just on, great. Bethany. And yeah, Bethany's great. And um, yeah, so they um, just were really gracious when I would show up to meals on Tuesday. They like accepted me for how little I had to give during that season. And um, yeah, community was just crucial for me during that time. So beautiful. And uh, tell us a little bit about what's next for you. Yeah, so um, just an update. I paid off all my medical bills. It's awesome. And <laughs> paid off all three of my credit cards that I racked up and um, I'm still in community. I'm thriving at a new job and totally have regained like my strength and confidence. And um, I'm on medication now that keeps me stable emotionally and physically. And um, I actually just accepted a job offer in Seattle for my dream job. Great job, wrong city. Yeah. Keep going. <laughs> Yeah, so um, I'm really excited about what God's doing, and he's, like, totally been preparing me for this moment and, like, building me up to, and like, through my community, building me up to be ready to take this next step faithfully. And, um, yeah, I'm just excited, and I hope to find a church and a community as good as the one as I have here. Yeah, that's awesome. Well, thank you so much. Let's give her a hand. Yeah. Thanks, Jackie. Yeah, thanks for your courage, Jackie. Gosh, that's, that's really brave of you, and we love you, and we miss you already. Let's stand and pray together.